Hey guys, what's up? I got everybody here from TMI. Don't forget to write us an email at TMIPodcast2018. That's TMIPodcast2018 at gmail.com. Let us know how we're doing. Also, check us out on Twitter. Follow us on Twitter at TMI underscore podcast 2018. Just use the numbers. Don't spell it out. Ooh, don't forget Facebook.com slash TMI podcast 2018. Follow us on the Apple podcast app. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a five star review. All you YouTubers out there, don't forget to subscribe to our channel, TMI Podcast 2018. Look for the popcorn bucket. That's right. Also, check us out on Spotify and the Google Play Music app for all you Android users. Follow us and subscribe everywhere. We appreciate it. We're doing it for you guys, the fans. Thank you. The moment our fellow geeks, dweebs, nerds, and other unfortunates have been fervently waiting for has finally arrived. It's time for TMI Confessionals of the Nerd Confessionals Kind. Of the nerd Confessionals kind. of the Nerd Kind. And now, your hosts, Dave Odinson Warhouski. Jeff Nerfherder Chandler. Jim Kaiju Baker. And Mike Mjolnir Evans. And now, let's get on with the show. Here is TMI. Should we have a round of Galileos before we begin? Galileo. 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 Gala. Gala minus. Galileo. Galileo. Uh, higher. Oh. higher. Higher, Jim. Can you go higher? Galileo. There you go. <laughs> I am actually going to apologize to the listening audience right now. Uh, I lost my voice earlier. When I went to Bohemian Rhapsody, I thought that it was an audience participation. I sang really loud and uh, was promptly kicked out of the theater. But I lost my voice in the process, so... It became a fun little sing-along at the end. Like a Rocky Horror type of thing. Yeah, basically. Just uh, without toast. <laughs> it's champagne flutes instead of toast. There you right? go. Yeah. yeah you, you don't want to be throwing those around, no. Yeah, no, we don't. Especially not full ones. Especially sure not on, on, on poor little Agnes who's sitting in front of you, probably. <laughs> she had like, this old lady in front of me literally had like 10 shopping bags. They had to go through all of her shots. You couldn't take those back to your car before going to the movies. Did she bring them from home? Were those her snacks? I she- don't know, but she was she was digging deep in there, so she must have had some Pringles or something. I don't know. Maybe some pate. Some yeah, pate some from, yeah, pate from <laughs> yeah. Pate. <laughs> she's got one of Freddie Mercury's cats at home that she's. Got, but yeah. Yeah, a lot of cats. If and if nobody has figured this out yet, since we haven't. No, right. We're just jumping in there. We forgot to announce what our movie was going to be this week, last week. So, so surprise! Surprise! Yeah, this just week. Just when you movie. thought we were going to review Littlefoot. Yeah, no. Smallfoot. Sorry. Smallfoot. <laughs> I was going to say, is there a, a sequel to Little Big Man <laughs> that I didn't know about? Already? Littlefoot. But no, we're doing Bohemian Rhapsody this week. We are indeed. And you're not going to believe it. Our classic feature. Finally, we've gotten to it. Highlander. Yes, I'm very excited for this. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, you Christophe Lambert fans. <laughs> Lambert. Yeah, how do you pronounce his name? I, it's, you can Lambert? either just go, you can go Christopher Lambert, or if you want to follow me, it's uh, Christophe Lambert. I wonder if there's a, a French restaurant out there that has a dish named after him, and they just... <laughs> They just look at you in disdain if you order it as, I'll have the Lambert, please. I'll have the Lambert with the escargot, please. Yeah. This is not alien. There is no <laughs> Lambert here. Lambert. <laughs> you know, he, he had just learned English right before this movie. Crazy, right? Really? Yeah. I would never have known that. That is <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> I'm shocked to learn. There can be only one. Well, I think what his only other movie was Tarzan, where he didn't speak English. Yeah, that's might as well describe his film career. There can be oh, only one. Man, <laughs> <laughs> we're starting early with this lambing. That's later on in the program. Yes, but we're going to start with Bohemian Rhapsody, which, unless you're living under a rock, you would rock. know that this is the biopic of Freddie Mercury and Queen. 
Queen. Not Queen Elizabeth. This is not Claire Foy. What? We're talking, about. Queen? we're talking about the rock band Queen. I have a problem with biopics in general, especially rock biopics. They just kind of elevate these moments into movie moments. For example, when Brian May in this movie comes up with We Will Rock You, so I have an idea. And it's just this right. epic thing. Boom, boom, boom. Really, did it really, you know, did it really go down like that? Did you I'm get, sure there's a lot of yeah. uh, creative uh, license. I realize that you have to do that for a movie, but just things like that don't ring true for me. So just, uh, I'm getting that off my chest, just from my, my problem with rock biopics in general. Uh, well, do you want to get into this or do you want to talk news first? We do actually, have some. yes, let's talk news. Yeah, I'm All getting right. ahead of myself here. You are. All right, news. Yes, all right. Austin Powers 4. Good idea? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you caught me off guard, but yes. Yeah. Austin yes. Powers 4. I was trying to think Austin Powers 3, and that's what it was gold member. Right? Gold member. So, not which the I didn't really not the strongest I, no. gold three. I didn't like Austin Powers 3 very much. Right. You know, we know Michael Myers had a nice little cameo in this Bohemian Rhapsody. A little too meta for my taste. We'll get into that. But what else has he really done? So is he going back to the well? It's supposedly it's in the works. Uh, Jay Roach is ready to direct. You got to get paid. I guess so. I'll probably be there. The cat in the hat really, I think, oh, the cat in the hat. derailed uh, Mike Myers. Which I watched it not too long ago. Why? It's not terrible. Why? It's really not terrible. You really no? give it another. I like that. No. That's a rave review right there. Mike. Have you ever rave seen him? it? No. Actually, I take that back. Actually, I take that back. I probably have seen it. I don't remember caring one way or the other. I, it didn't leave an impression on me. Well, for most, I mean, kids I do movies, like him. I think yeah. I think he brings a lot. You know, he's a fun actor that just brings a lot of fun stuff to it. So uh, maybe I'll have to watch it again. I tell you, my son loved it when he was seven. You know, he's eight now, but we watched it about a year ago. And yeah. at the time, he just wanted to get it from the library over and over and over again. And mm. there are some funny moments in it. So okay. I could say that about most kids' movies, actually. It's not yeah. terrible. And that's a pretty glowing review. But. Okay. Well, let's see. When it comes out, we'll, uh, we'll review it and we'll pair it up with Cat in a Hat. Yeah, Mike has been much missed, I think, by me anyway. And I was uh, re very happy to see him in Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh, I thought you were talking about our Mike, who's been absent. Uh, him too. Him, yes. Him How was your concert, by the way, Mike? It was most excellent. It was, uh, I saw it at the SSE Center in Belfast, and it only seats uh, 13,000 people. Oh, wow. So there's not a bad seat in the house, and we had good seats in a place where there were no bad seats. So this was a U2 concert. Yeah, I was going to say, Mike did not see Queen. He, he saw U2. <laughs> did you, uh, you didn't get any uh, Bono sweat on you? No, no, we weren't that close. Okay, all right. Very cool. All now, right, so tell, Austin, now tell me this, Mike. Actually, just really quickly. When U2 plays in America, all you see are Irish flags. When they play in Ireland, are they waving Irish flags? or are there, they... were, there were no Irish flags. Okay, good. I'm they glad. knew where they were. They knew where they were. Uh, okay, so Austin Powers off the table. Uh, Ridley Scott has announced that Gladiator 2 is in the works. Did we not kill off Maximus in the first one? What, what are you going to do with the sequel? Why? I, I don't even remember. Did he die at the end? Yeah, he yeah. died. Yeah, he went off to the wheat fields. He was yeah. with his family. The fields of Elysium. There you go. He did die. Uh, supposedly, it'll center on the young kid who survived. The son of Lucius, I think was his name. I yeah. don't know. I just don't see. I, I, it doesn't make any sense to me. Just another excuse for Russell Crowe to be in a Ridley Scott movie because they. Well, uh, well, I guess. Ridley, well, so go down that road with Russell Crowe actually commissioned somebody to write a sequel. And it was a much more over the top about his character coming back like he was in Hades in hell and he had to battle all these underworld demons to get back to the real world. Oh, that would have been Which actually awesome. seems pretty cool. But I don't think that that's where they're going with it. But that's really kind of a crazy over the top. He would have to go on a, a workout regimen because boy, that Russell Crowe, he's... Like, would he, that have been called Gladiator 2, The Quickening? The think? Quickening. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So that seems interesting, but I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, the first one is great. It's a great movie, but really Scott's just mining everything that he created 20, 30 years ago. I'm You're just impressed that Ridley Scott is still directing. Uh, he's, he is. Uh, he's over 80 at this point. Yeah, isn't yeah, he's still cranking them yeah. out. Pretty impressive. Your boy Godzilla turned 65 on November yeah. 3rd. Yeah, big celebration. I guess Toho, once, once these uh, legendary movies are out of the way, they're cranking up production. They're going back in. It's all Godzilla all the time. 
are they doing another Shin Godzilla? Or are they going in a different? Direction? I don't know if they're doing Shin Godzilla, but I do. I did see that they are. You know, straight up, they're committed. They're committed to this monster universe. So I guess maybe after Kong versus Godzilla, Legendary will lose the license. If no, really? I mean, I mean, if it does well, why would you not let them? Con- exactly. Make? Yeah. And then you go off and do your own thing. It's just going to further publicize the Toho movies even more so in America. Because if you Cause... remember, the I think the last time a Toho movie was released theatrically to you know to a wide array of theaters was Godzilla 2000, which was after the debacle mm, of, of the 98 yeah. Godzilla. <laughs> we don't even we don't call that Godzilla at all. No, that's a big giant monster that attacked New York and then became Jurassic Park. <laughs> so you're saying Jurassic Park is the sequel to Godzilla? I think so. I think that's where all those little baby uh, velociraptors came from. Right. You're bringing the universes together. There you go. The Emmerich Godzilla, I think, is like Jurassic Park 2.5. That's probably... 2.5. It'll just slice right in there somewhere. Uh, The only other news I have, I think at one point in all of our lives, we have watched Watership Down or read the book. Yes. Uh, Yes. Read the book. Were we as traumatized as I think by this movie or this book? Because it was pretty heavy handed. I'm not traumatized by it. You were not? And yet Night Stalker kept you up. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I I was disturbed. Like, there's some scary scenes in that animated version. I mean, it's pretty... No, am I all alone in that? Yeah, Maybe no, that no, 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 no. One viewing for me as a kid was enough. I didn't want to watch it again after. Not because well, I was scared of it, just because it was unpleasant. So It is. Like, it's a very unpleasant movie. Yeah. yeah, especially as a kid. Because, you know, it's one thing if it's humans or if it's, you know, crocodiles. But you got cute little fuzzy bunnies. So yeah. uh, BBC and Netflix are creating a two-part new version. Ooh, It'd be like a CG type of thing. So I don't know. Are they going to stay true to the book? Are they going to be as heavy handed as the original? Are they going to water it down? No, no pun intended. Oh, yeah, nice. No. Yeah. Was Four the points. original was the original a Ralph Bashke uh, animation? Uh, that sounds correct, but I can't verify that. I don't. Rem- I'm, it's probably right in that timeline where he was like really hitting his stride. Uh, yeah, because he kind of cornered the market on adult animation back yeah. then. So anyway, so I thought that was interesting that they are going down that road. So that's it. That's all the news I have. Did you guys uh, hit this last week or the week before with uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier? The live action uh, show that they're talking about? Yes. Uh, We did not talk about it. This is an addition to the possible lineup on the Marvel streaming service. Right. So with uh, Scarlet Witch and Loki, they've also announced uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier. As like a duo same show or they each get their own show i think it's they each get their own show hmm. you get a show like a, you get a like show a, everybody get a, gets yeah, a right show. Oprah's, <laughs> Oprah's in charge over there yeah. now she's i would like it if they did like uh what was it spider-man presents or or the marvel uh two in one where he always had like the thing always had like a guest yeah. Every week. Like, like the thing, like hosts it like Alfred Hitchcock at the beginning of the show. <laughs> Into those names. Uh, I would like it where there was a different uh, guy that he, uh, every episode they, they have a misunderstanding, they fight, and then they realize they're on the same side, and then they beat up the bad guy. That, that, was, the, that was the whole essence of the Marvel team up. Oh, yeah, you know, he always had his heavy, yeah. two, two, the misunderstanding where the two good guys fight each other and then realize that they're on the same side. Well, you'll never get it because uh, the thing is Fantastic Four and not owned by Disney. Well, I'm not saying thing per se, but just could we get other second tier characters, Marvel characters showing up in these shows? And Falcon actually, uh, well, he would show up in Captain America all the time. Yeah, it was Captain America and uh, the Falcon for a while. Yeah, right. I don't know. Interesting. And you know what's sad about that is, to Mike's point, how Fantastic Four is in the realm of 20th Century Fox, but now that's owned by Disney. So it could happen. Uh, it also, oh. I've also read reports in the uh, Hollywood Reporter that China might be putting a stomp on this, trying, really? trying to cut down on this. Yeah, I don't know whether they're going to cry that it's a monopoly or that they're or, or throw more money. I don't know. It's not a done deal yet, per se, but I think wheels are already in motion. I mean, we're already getting scrolls in Captain Marvel. Yep. So yeah. It, yeah. Something's got, there's got to be a give and take already. Mm-hmm. It's only I, a matter of time, whether it's... But one of the best Marvel team-ups, in my opinion, was always Spider-Man and the Human Torch. And I would love to see yeah, that. Yeah, they were always fun. Yeah. So this is a podcast about Bohemian Rhapsody. We should also <laughs> just remind our listeners. <laughs> yeah, are we done with our news? Or can we are, we get we into are it? done with news. 
So, gentlemen, Bohemian Rhapsody has been getting a bad rap, as they say, a bad rhapsody oh. from critics around the country. I uh, I don't know who these critics are, but I think they need to lighten up. I, I what is what is, the, what is the slap against it? The slap against it is, is that what? That's one of the things. It's I because I do agree with that. I mean, it's stupid to say, but you know, going in, who he is and what he was, and I think the word gay is mentioned once. Bisexual and queer. That I mean, you don't have to knock me over the head with it. I don't need to see. Yeah, they did kind of skirt around that a little bit. His personal life, which I think maybe some people went in thinking they were going to get more. But that I did read as well with uh, Rami Malek, who portrays Freddie in this movie, that they only had two hours. And and what did they want to focus on? So they had to skirt around some things if they wanted to put more of a spotlight on the music. So it's, you know, there's compromises, obviously. Yeah, so. there was the interview I saw with the cast said that there's easily a five-hour version of this movie out there right. somewhere because they did film a lot of songs that didn't make the cut. There's probably a lot of more backstory stuff that just, again, you got you got to weed it down. You got yeah, it. it's somebody's life that you're just you putting in two it. hours. Right, and, and it really, you know, you go from he meets the band and they're immediately touring touring and then all of a sudden they get a record you are so you, you, like you like jim right. what you said before which is you're skipping to these key moments you're not i my one swipe against it is the whole bohemian rhapsody scene where that where they're in the recording studio up in the barn in the farm and it's it's a fun little montage you're seeing the creative process but i want to see more of that you know maybe you you make it sound like you know that they they sensationalize that but but those songs were so out there and so iconic it seemed to me that there has to be more of a creative process that went into that back and forth you see i enjoyed that scene where they were creating that song oh that was fun it was very yeah. fun yeah that I didn't just want seem, to see more of that yeah that that didn't seem like throw away okay here's a classic moment there were they that was pretty detailed as to what they did to create that um sonic palette but right. then you have a scene like where freddie first meets the other members of Queen. Well, I guess you need a lead singer. That you know. Did right. you, oh, here's some lyrics. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And that Not was with those teeth, teeth, he said. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed the show. I also write songs. Uh, lead singer just quit. But then you'll need someone new. Right. Did you ever find yourself looking in his mouth when he when he was singing and he lifted up to see if you could see his teeth behind that thing, <laughs> <laughs> like a shark? Well, yeah, because it's got to just be. It's got to be like a prosthetic that lays yeah. over his real teeth. Right. right. I mean, for him to be able to enunciate and to act with that thing in his mouth i mean it's very impressive and i and I, I one of the other swipes that i read was that whoever created this didn't know what made freddie mercury so special and i just laughed because brian may who is one of the band members is it produced this thing as so did think. roger taylor who was right. the drummer yeah. yeah so the two of them i think would have as much knowledge as anybody else going into this is who and what he was this is just a critic who has no idea what it went into who kn who doesn't know freddie mercury himself i'm sure you know i may be mistaken but i'm sure whoever wrote that didn't know the man himself so how can you make that judgment so it's all criticism is just arbitrary like this so and we're, we'll get into this with highlander as well because jeff you were saying how you saw all these comments oh i was yeah, I got very incensed. These critics take offense at, at, at a movie like this, but and they'll give it a backhanded compliment. Like, well, you know, it's exhilarating at the same time. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, so go into, they finish Bohemian Rhapsody and they try and sell it to the, uh, the record producer who is played by Michael Myers. No one will play Queen. And they finally, you know, they, they basically tell him to go F off and they just promoted themselves and then you just get this montage of all these critic reviews coming up panning yeah. the song mm -hmm. as just being mundane and nonsensical and lazy and you know we all know what it is that i mean that was one of the like a huge laugh in the theater right because yeah, it was we, probably you know, the greatest moment yeah i mean in hindsight you're looking at this stuff and you just you know it's like reading a bad review in hollywood reporter about star wars when it came out yeah. oh, that's a kid flick and it'll never go anywhere which is funny because it could really be predicting the reviews of this movie that oh, that are probably yeah. right right but I, you know we've talked many times which there are certain movies that are just critic proof and this is this is one of them which it doesn't the musical scenes are unbelievable and they are so visceral and in you know the sound quality in my theater was awesome because you really felt like you were in the moment and then it would cut to like these quiet like like dead quiet scenes in between of the the character moments of, of freddie 
and uh, his family in the band. It was a weird dichotomy, which you had these over the top bombastic performances and then followed by these super quiet moments, which I thought was interesting. I wanted something that had more the feel of like straight out of Compton. You know, that just seemed like more of a real review of their lives versus right. what Queen yeah. was, you know? I mean, they kind of followed the same steps where, you know, you meet the band and then right. they start to get yeah. famous and stuff like that. But I, I wasn't expecting more of a grittier feel that that movie has, but I, I kind of was like looking for a little bit more of that feel. That's it's interesting. Like, That's, and I wonder though, because Brian Singer gets credit for this, but he was fired ha- halfway through. Yeah. So how much is him, how much is this other guy uh, who was a Dexter Flex, Fletcher came in and basically finished, I don't know where one ends and the other begins right. and, and what, for the cast to say that there's a five hour version of this movie, it might've been grittier. It might've been in, you know, there had to have been a decision somewhere at some point where they wanted to kind of sanitize all that non-musical stuff. I mean, I just had the sense that, and there are some known things in, in this movie where, you know, the, it didn't actually happen the way that it's portrayed in the movie, that I, I just had the sense that their real lives were probably more interesting in some cases than were portrayed in the actual movie. And right. that just didn't come through for me. See, that's the, what I was saying before about the, the whole biopic thing, is that it has to be sanitized for mass consumption, right. you know? Yeah. And this is a 20th century Fox movie. It's not a little indie, you know, production. So they, they do it with the studio heads probably looking over their shoulders and approving the script and all this stuff. So Well, I think you, you're right. You want to be true to the, to the actor and, and, you know, the person that he was and not get mired down in, you know, the age thing and what that really, you know, the, the, the closest you got was the press conference for Hot Space where they really started peppering him with questions about, his personal life. I mean, you got it. You saw it. I don't know. It just, it was there, but it wasn't there. Like they left a lot, you know, very ambiguous. The later years of his life of this movie, the, the of post 1980, let's say, were kind of skirted over. Um, but I think there was more detail in the earlier time period of the film, like from 70 to 80. Right. And I really enjoyed that whole interaction with his family and where he came from and who he you know, his dad and the relationship he had with his parents, uh, I thought was very interesting. Now, I also, I have a gay child. So seeing that and seeing a parent either embrace your child for who and what they are or knock them down for it. Uh, And obviously, you know, the dad came around, but it was that true. Not every family relationship ends on a hug as you go off to Live Aid. (laughs) Right on the TV because there's my son dying, but... I now love yep. him. He's going to blow us a kiss. You know, look at yeah, that. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I was surprised that they did put in the full Live Aid concert. The full, yes. Yeah, you yeah. know what was yeah. great? I loved the bookend. You know, and I think, yeah. we even, I mean, Jim and I, we, we spoke, well, I think all three of us at one point, like we spoke about like that is the seminal moment for this band. And so for them to kind of frame this entire story on that moment was genius. Yeah. And Jeff and I I were speaking about this. We watched Live Aid, you know, while it was happening, not there. I'm sure I did as well. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was we are we are that generation. Absolutely. I mean, this was this was unprecedented. This was this was this was the middle of the summer, you know, when you should be outside running around playing, doing things with your friends, and you were glued to the TV from like seven in the morning till like eight o'clock at night. Any band, and they even make mention of this, which is any band that was worthy back in the day was a part of this. Yes, yes. And all I kept thinking of was, where'd that money go? Because <laughs> we're still starving people in Africa. We should be doing this every year. Yeah. How come we're not doing this for people in, yeah. the, in America? And Live Aid, I taped the entire, pretty much the entire thing on the VHS, which yeah. I watched uh, over and over and over again. And even though that Live Aid was the event that kicked me off on my almost almost lifelong Bowie obsession um, it all stemmed from Live Aid the one performance that was the standout and that still is the standout for me is Queen yeah yeah and I have no argument with that Queen blew away everybody else on that stage because they did yeah if you go on YouTube I mean their their whole set the uh, you know every artist had 20 minutes that whole set is up on there and if you watch that and then you watch this movie I mean they replicated this I mean, right down to the nuance. I mean, it was very impressive to the point where I'm like, how are they, how do they pull this off? And supposedly they did film in Wembley stadium 
with about 7,000 people. And then obviously the rest is CG. You're bringing in old footage from the, sh- from the, right. from the broadcast at yeah. the time. And, and that they, they, yeah, I read that they rebuilt the stage of the yeah, like, made stage as well. So everything around him on that stage is real. It's actually there. That's crazy. It, it was very, it was very impressive. Yeah. The only song I think they cut from is uh, We Will Rock You, which they did at Live Aid, but they did not include in the Live Aid performance. Well, I mean, it, it, here in the movie. Right. To me, Radio Gaga is up there as one of my favorites. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, this, th- and this so performance did actually, it for me. That's, yeah. that's why it's one of my well, favorite songs. The other thing I find is funny, which is uh, I Want to Break Free is also one of my favorite songs. And I don't remember in the movie, they said that MTV banned the video because they're all in drag. Yeah. I saw it on MTV. Yeah. 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 Well, exactly. I remember yeah. specifically being blown yeah. away by this video. And like, I didn't think it was gay at all. It was just, it was funny because here's a guy in full drag with pearls vacuuming with a damn mustache. I'm thinking, well, maybe I just saw it on Friday Night Lights. Yeah, no, no, Friday it was Night on videos. MTV. And that's so, not even controversial. Like, even for then, it wasn't controversial. That, so I don't, you know, right, that, that was the one thing in the movie where I'm like, I don't remember it being banned. Yeah, no, it wasn't. There was a lot of other, they were playing fast and loose with the facts and the t- actual timeline. Because, for example, okay, I'm going to be that guy now. But I was, I was a little bit, nip. <laughs> and I'm not even a, a huge, huge Queen fan, even though I have a greatest hits. I have night at the opera, you know, I don't have every album. Right. But still these little inconsistencies bothered me. And I can't imagine if a huge Queen fan was watching this, what they would, but, but for example, humor me for a second, <laughs> the, the initial U S <laughs> tour that they go on, that they're so excited about in reality, this takes place in 1974 and yeah. they're seen on stage singing Fat Bottom Girls, which didn't which exist is- until 1978. <laughs> so that was the first thing that popped There you me. go. And then when they start talking about um, coming up with We Will Rock You, it's after they've already entered 1980. And We Will Rock You came out in 1977. So, so little things like this really bother me. Which is weird, because if you're going to be true to the rise of this well that's even like they pulled out who wants to live forever from the highlander soundtrack which we'll get into mm-hmm. at the most heartbreaking moment when he when he finds out he has aids but they don't make that song for another eight years yeah i but, accepted that because it was uh, background music it wasn't yeah, like part of the plot uh, you know right just like when they did under pressure a few years after that it came out it was a you know they used it as like a background song it wasn't part of the plot right. Yeah. But, you know, if you're going to go through the trouble of, of perfectly recreating that Live Aid sequence like they did, and yet then just run haphazard with all their other <laughs> continuity. If we can sell them on this, well, how, so were you like just blown away? Even the, the 20th century opening credit? When they go oh, with the guitar, rock. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was awesome. I mean, that actually yeah. elicited a cheer from people in the yes. audience. And I'll tell you, my crowd applauded. It wasn't just a smattering of applause either. The entire crowd applauded after the movie was over yeah like i said there was people singing i mean once you get you know i mean that was the whole thing when he gets into i want to be immersive and i want to have the band involved you know the audience involved as well and that's where you know we will rock you and some of this other stuff came from and and it translated into the theater where people were were so invested with these with these concert recreations it was a lot of fun and we all know that they're lip-syncing but he did a damn good job. Yes, he I, did. I, I, they all did. I, the guy who played Brian May, I, I kept thinking he's Howard Stern. But <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but Jim brought up an interesting, and I didn't realize it, which is uh, uh, Deacon. Yeah, John Deacon. Deakey, the bass player, is played by Joseph Mazzello, who is the little kid from Jurassic Park. That blows me away. I did not know that. Oh, wow. It's just like a flock of birds evading a predator. They're a... Uh... They're flocking this way. And we just brought that up when we were saying, dude, when they bring back Jurassic Park, they should just bring back those two characters, yeah. Timmy and, should, and Lexi. Yeah, they should. And, and what's funny is, now that we know that Joseph Mazzello is still, you know, a very credible actor, they could totally do that. But yeah. what, what's funny is he's channeling, because I, I, I was watching him because I knew who he was, watching Bohemian Rhapsody. So I'm looking to see it like little traces of the little kid from Jurassic Park to come through. And every once in a while I did see it, but it's funny. I'm watching his performance. It's almost like he's doing Stan Laurel with all the facial expressions. Oh, he did do a lot. Yeah. 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 You're right. 
As if Stan think, Laurel smells something bad. That was his one acting go-to. <laughs> yeah. Well, I will say out of the four band members, he was the least developed. And I think that Freddie, when he was kind of ripping them apart, he even made mention, and Deacon, I don't even know what you do. Like, <laughs> like, like if you weren't part of this band, I don't even know what your interests are in. I don't know. You have family. Do you, like, you, knew, you know, so we're, as the audience, yeah. we're like, we don't know this guy either. And I also like the fact that they made a little dig at Brian May never cutting his hair throughout all the years no, of Queen. No, yeah, no, he his looked exactly the same. still looks the same, I think. Yep. So, yeah, we, we mentioned before, there's a lot of songs that didn't make the cut. You know, crazy little thing called love, the game. Uh, and Jim, you you lamented the fact that there's no mention whatsoever of Flash Gordon. Yes, none. <laughs> Which none. is very sad because that, I mean, that's that had to have been a huge moment for them to cut an album, you know, a soundtrack. I know, which probably led them to the Highlander soundtrack. Oh, absolutely. But the Highlander took place after Live Aid. It had to have. Oh, it did. It did. Yeah, 86, did yeah. Right. And then the, the Kind of Magic album which accompanied Highlander. It wasn't really the Highlander soundtrack, but it was just another Queen album with a lot of those songs. Right. I, I enjoyed it. I, I really like this. If you're a, even a nominal fan of Queen, this, is, this movie just, it rocks. It, it really does. I really enjoyed it. I would like to give the finger to all the critics that are, are putting it down. Just don't listen to those reviews. Go see it. Yeah. And especially if you if you were part of that live aid generation, like to me, it was it was amazing to see them recreate this, and it it flashed me back to a kid sitting in front of my TV watching this un unfold. I mean, I, uh, I actually got emotional. Um, oh, I did as well. I got yeah. tingles up and down. My yeah, spine. no, well, yeah, I might have shed a tear in the corner yeah. of my eye because I was, you know, hoarse. You wanted more. You want more of the music. You want yeah. like you truly appreciate just how revolutionary this group was and what they did and what he did i was just like please please more of this you know yeah, yeah yeah so can we talk about the michael myers cameo for one second because that was the one it did get a big laugh but it was it was kind of a come on so he plays the emi uh record producer ray foster and they're trying like he wants them to just replicate uh killer queen and they're like, listen, man, we gotta, we gotta move forward. We, you know, we, we're progressive. We gotta, you know, let our wings fly. So they go off and they create Bohemian Rhapsody. They come back, they play it for him, and he absolutely despises it. He hates it, and he wants nothing to do with it. And so he wants to release um, "You're My Best Friend" as their first cut. And he's arguing with them, and he says, he says, no one will ever bang their head in a car listening to Bohemian Rhapsody. Which is a complete and utter meta moment because that's exactly what he does as Wayne in Wayne's World. And it's the most iconic moment in Wayne's World of them banging their heads to Bohemian Rhapsody. So and it was that just, moment, that actually, back in the early 90s, that brought Queen back. Into yeah, the they actually, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. even after Live Aid, I think, I think they said that, you know, skyrocketed their, uh, their sales. And that was, that was well before iTunes or Apple. So you actually had to go back into a store. You actually had to go back in the store and go into their inventory and look up back issues of uh, Queen's uh, Queen's albums and dig them out. I will say the uh, the album where they're where they're getting with the robot and they're all in his hand and he's got news, blood on his news finger. of the world. That, freak, the world. that freaked me out. I would never listen to that album as a kid because it freaked me out that that robot like squished him. That's the one that's got "We Will Rock You" and yes, "We Are the Champions." Yeah, well, I discovered that later. So yes, that's yeah, all I got took, on this. It actually one. took me a while to realize that that was Mike Myers. I knew the voice first. Well, I yeah. saw his credit. Yeah. Like, well, that's like Littlefinger. I don't even know the actor's name, but as soon as I heard his voice, I'm like, "Oh, I know that guy." And yeah. it took me a minute, and then I I placed it that he's obviously from Game of Thrones. Littlefinger. Yeah. The 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 the. the Placidus. Oh, you don't, you don't even watch Game of Thrones. No, I don't. No. So I, I, thought, I thought you were talking about He's Smallfoot again. He's the Duplicitous one like, that, that always was trying to get in uh, Sansa's pants. You know, the comb over guy. The, uh, not, not uh, they called him uh, Miami, the other guy. The other, he fires him, kicks him out of the car. So onwards, onwards so, to... So how many buckets are we giving? Oh, that's right. We need to give it buckets. We need, we need buckets. Just for the music alone, I'm going for. Jim, you go. I would give it... I would give it four as well. I might even go four and a quarter. Wow. You know, Jim, yeah. you knocked me down a little bit with the continuity, uh, which wasn't <laughs> bothering me as much until, <laughs> until, you until you pointed it out. Right. So I'm going to go three and a half, I think, mainly on the notion, and this is a continuity type thing, is the band did not break up before Live Aid. 
or not to my recollection. No, so, they did not. Right. And I, it was like, I don't think that that added that much to the story that you needed to do that. So I'm just like, I got, I'll go three and a half and, and, and with a correction. Then. Well, that's like, that's like, you know, the, you know, story building one Oh one, you got it. You know, you got boulders, bigger and bigger boulders. And then, you know, you have this cathartic moment and you know, he comes back and begs their forgiveness and all is good again. So. Yeah. And then they, of course, to end it with Live Aid, I don't think that anything, if you had kept the movie going after Live Aid, it wouldn't have been as climactic. No, no, no. Yeah. I think, you know, to book it, like I said before, to book end with that performance is genius. Yeah. I, I was like, end it here, guys. This is, yeah. 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 yeah the continuity nice thing, soul. again, nice it, that didn't really affect my review that much because, again, I'm not like a mega, mega Queen fan. So it didn't offend me. I just noticed it. But say if this was a Bowie biopic and they had him as Ziggy Stardust singing Young Americans, I'd probably <laughs> walk out of the theater. <laughs> you, would have, you would have a moment. You'd be like, what is this? So yeah. speaking of popcorn buckets, as I'm, I'm, so I went in early yesterday and I'm only going to get a soda. And as I'm standing there at the concession stand, the manager walks in with these little bags of bright orange popcorn. They now have Dorito, oh no, Cheetos flavored popcorn. And I immediately said, I need one of those. <laughs> and it was, it was those uh, Cheeto crunch, like mixed yeah. in with, it was like crunched up. So, so your popcorn was bright orange and it just left my fingers tarnished. But then it had actual Cheeto crunches in it. And it was the greatest thing ever. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta do this when I get home. Well, that sounds wonderful. I think we should go get some right now. I think so. Let's go. Health food, huh? Yeah. Back on the health food diet. Yeah. Visit our snack bar now for a fresh assortment of Cracker Jacks, mixed specialties, and delicious candies. Or popping fresh popcorn, salty and delicious, in the right size for you as you like it. Refresh yourself with a cold, icy, sparkling soft drink. We have all of your favorite flavors. Visit our snack bar now. Your picture will start in one minute. We are pleased to be able to bring you this fine entertainment. And we hope that you will enjoy it. We also hope that you've had the opportunity to visit our snack bar. And remember, after the movie, be especially careful on your way home. So, okay, so what do we want to tackle next? Do we want to go Highlander or do we want to do, go Night Stalker? I think we got, to we got to follow up Queen with Highlander. Yeah. All right then. All right, let's do yeah, it. We got, to, we got to stay on that same wavelength because this is completely bypassed in the movie as well. We never, and you know, we, like I said, we, we do get the uh, Who Wants to Live Forever. Very apropos, I think. They, yeah, it was a little too on the nose. So you guys, you guys take this one because I'm a newbie to Highlander. So you guys are intimately involved already with this film. Well, I will say, aside from Star Wars and Back to the Future, I have seen this movie more times than any other. Doesn't mean it's a great movie, but it's up there. With, it's probably one of my top five movies. It was in heavy rotation, wasn't it, Jeff? Uh, back in the day, on um, like HBO or something. Well, I will tell you, I saw this. This is this is one of the very first movie. This is the very first movie that I went into a theater in 1986, saw the movie, and then snuck across and saw a second movie for free. And that second movie was Ridley Scott's Legend. So I saw those two movies back to back. This movie is probably one of the first that really showed me that a film can be art and not just a movie like there's scenes there's very iconic set pieces going on in this thing jim you're much better at like setting up the plot and whatnot but i'm i'm completely going to talk about this movie just from a visual point of view like i came i have sketches in my sketchbook from 1986 probably four or five key scenes in this movie that just stuck with me the the ramirez kurgan fight in the tower with the lightning in there up on the staircase I, super iconic even like the the film the transitions where they were bouncing back and forth between the past and the present he's in a, a, a parking garage and the camera pans up and now you're coming up above ground in scotland you know 1500s uh they do the same thing when uh they pan up from his uh fish tank and you're now on the lock in in scotland in scotland right and the same thing when he's on his deathbed in scotland his face fades into the Mona Lisa, which is a, a wall graphic on one of the, the buildings in New York City. Like stuff like that just blew me away. And I'm sure it's been done before. It's not revolutionary, but as an impressionable artist, 
Like I saw this and was just like, this is the coolest thing ever. Uh, I just absolutely love this movie. And I know that they're detractors. Those are the things I came away from. These, these, these kind of iconic um, moments art wise. Yeah. I like the way that they handled, you know, the present and the flashbacks. You know, I, I just felt that it really, you know, helped bring the story together, even so much as, you know, when, you know, he saves the little girl in World War II and then she becomes his secretary. And you just now see that's so you saw that that's the European version that was not in the theatrical version uh, released initially. That only showed up here in the 10th anniversary edition. There's multiple. Jim and I had this discussion. There's multiple versions of this movie with just small little moments that are changed the european versus the american and then the 10th anniversary but that's one of the biggest scenes that was cut from the american and then so, so was the secretary not in the american version at all she's in she's in there but you don't get her backstory where you find out that he found her saved her as a little kid during world war ii because there's a line when he leaves and he says you know it's a it's a certain type of magic that's what he says to her right. in the flashback, but you yes. don't get that reference when he says it to her when she's an old lady and he's now leaving to go off to you know fight Kurgan. So I was there. I was in Scotland in 1999. I was in Eileen Donan Castle. That whole village is built over the parking lot. Like you yeah. go there, that's a parking lot. Yeah, they don't play it up very much either at Eileen Doon, uh, the castle there. So when you go and you visit it, they don't really talk about the Highlander being filmed or, or at least to my recollection, they didn't. Well, I don't know if it's necessarily a highly... Uh, touted movie i mean it it does have its cult i mean it, listen it spawned two sequels in a television show that ran for i don't know six or seven seasons not that i watched the tv show or cared about the sequels by the way if you like this movie don't watch the sequels. <laughs> yeah you do not end i think i've seen the second one and, and nothing beyond that no because the second one negates everything that happens in the first one all right you're like this is just stupid it ended and it should be done with Right. It is, it is just a phenomenal standalone. And again, we, we were just goofing before on the, you know, Christopher Lambert is a Christophe Lambert. However you want to pronounce his name, the guy spoke no English when they hired him for this movie. There can be only one. <laughs> Which is like, what? Someone well, better he was, get this he guy was in Greystoke before this, right? But did he Greystoke, that's Greystoke? what it was. Yeah, I kept yeah. saying Tarzan, but Greystoke. But he didn't really speak much of that either. No, he didn't. Like he's French, and that's a cool thing, which is obviously he's he's doing a much better job of trying to actually solicit a Scottish accent, unlike Sean Connery, who I read actually worked with a voice coach to make him sound Spanish. What? what? Sound Spanish. Are you oh, kidding me? That is muddy wasted <laughs> because he is straight up, he is just straight up Sean Connery. Yes. He's like, I am Juan Sanchez Villa Lobos Ramirez. You must learn to conceal your special gift and harness your power until the time of the gathering. I mean, he's just doing Sean Connery stuff. Yeah, that's all he's doing. Yeah. And let's uh, go back. Let's let's go back to Christopher Lambert for a second. This okay. guy has the most amazing um, forehead and eyebrows <laughs> that I have ever seen. If they ever need to go Mesmerized. back and make a and and have like a, a recreation of the Boris Karloff Frankenstein monster, this guy. That's it, this <laughs> did um did you hear this jeff that they filmed sean connery's whole bit in a week in a week and he got paid like a million bucks or something yep and yeah. you think he i mean he was in that movie a lot yeah but i guess you know if you if you cut it down i mean how many right i mean what is it 15 minutes maybe mm -hmm. when all is said and done and that's where he lives, right? It's probably right in his backyard. Oh, yeah, he probably yeah. just went home. Yeah, he probably just went. Well, that's, I mean, the, the two of them hit it off so well. That's probably the only reason a sequel exists is because they enjoyed working together so much that they demanded they make a sequel. Can't they, they go out to dinner instead? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, if you're going to pay me a million dollars for 15 minutes worth of work, I'm definitely going to be like, listen, we should do this again. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing I'll bring up, so the opening shot is in Madison Square Garden. It wasn't filmed there, but it's supposed to take place. The, the wrestling match, and this is where you break, I mean, right from the beginning, you get the Queen soundtrack. And now I know that people are like, wow, this is not the you know, Queen's strongest, but Princes of the Universe is, for me, up there with the top three songs of Queen. It and because it's so tied, yeah, it is yeah. so tied into this movie for me. But the opening shot is a big aerial swirl. And, and you almost, you hear like this helicopter tw -tw 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 sound effect. And it just swirls over the audience with a wrestling rink. And you pan up 
to Connor sitting up in the rafters. And it, it all seems like one clean shot. We, uh, we could get away with that with like a drone. But back then, that was some pretty sophisticated wire work. And they used that a couple times. Uh, if, you, if you watch The Last Jedi, that's, they basically that whole training sequence between Luke and Rey is just a ripoff of this training sequence with, with Connor and, and Ramirez when they're on the cliffs. Same thing. And then even at the, with his fight with Kurgan at the end. Same thing. The camera is swirling on the ground. It comes in, it comes in, it's swirling around them kind of a thing. Like stuff like that, just it makes this movie for me because, again, it's, it, it, it really was the first time that I saw a movie and saw it for not just a story, but the production end of it. That listen, There's continuity errors galore in this thing. I mean, silly stuff. I don't. It doesn't matter. Now, getting back to that fight on the top of the cliff that you were just talking about, I hope that wasn't Ramirez's favorite sword because that's he, he flung it over the side. Yeah, <laughs> well, swords dis- right. Swords tend to disappear. You know, you get knocked out of your hands. The next scene is back in their hands. I mean, he's walking around in a trench coat with this sword, and yet he's sitting down. He's doing all kinds of stuff, and it's like that thing would. I mean, you can't even sit down with a phone in your pocket, and yet this guy's got a four foot sword. But there is a lot of dichotomy going on in this movie in terms of it's balancing the artistic, as what you were saying, with all these sweeping shots. Russell Mulcahy came from the MTV video world. So he's done, you know, any iconic MTV video you can think of from the early 80s, he directed. You've got all the Duran Duran videos from Rio, Hungry Like the Wolf. So he came Wild from Boys, that pedigree um, of, wow. the Buggles video killed the radio star. He did. Oh, really? You know, all the Elton John, all the cult, Culture Club, Human League, all those new wave bands. He did that, like, kind of set MTV in motion back in the early. Wow, movie. I don't think I. So knew. he's got all those chops. You know, the the quick cuts, and, and it's, it's funny as I was looking him up online, and it said there is some website that said that he is known for windblown drapery and fans and, <laughs> and there's a lot of that going on in is that, is that his business card it's yeah his but, business but card. you know obviously there's a lot more to him than that but there is a lot of windblown drapery and fans in highlander and probably a lot of his other work as well but i'm saying dichotomy here because highlander also has a cheesy side jeff i it know does. that you're not oh, gonna listen, like this I'm not, no no i listen it, it You've said it. it's a product of its time, first and foremost. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very, I think it's very similar in tone and in style to the first Terminator movie. Um, not yeah. only because they're both canon films, but it's, they, they both have that mid 80s feel to it. It's got yeah. the non Queen soundtrack, I think, kind of rattles along, kind of like the Terminator soundtrack does. Kurgan is very Terminator esque we can say yeah not not that i'm saying that they're ripping off ripping off no but but but. you're right you're right there's a lot of very similar scenes uh terminator in his hotel room putting together his weapons you got the same thing with kurgan and his swords you know he's driving around the city in a stolen car little iconic things like but you're right visually it does have but again because because what there may be a two-year three-year window between the two of them Right. And, and yeah, the, and these aren't the only two movies that look like this. Probably any any action movie of right. any rated R action movie of the mid 80s kind of had this visual style going on. So it's not to say that it's trapped in the 80s, but it's just a product of the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but the Queen soundtrack elevates it well above most. Yes. Uh, and I'd like to point out that on that Queen album, A Kind of Magic, it also featured another film, Iron Eagle. Do you remember? Yes. Uh, One Vision. Remember that song? I don't remember that song. No, no. That was a Queen song? That was a Queen song. Yes, yes. That was another movie they made like multiple sequels to. How many Highlander sequels have they made besides Uh, Highlander 2? Highlander 2 is The Quickening and then uh, Highlander 3 Endgame, which I think was Mario Van Peebles. I think there's only three. But again, you know, the TV show kind of had its own life and it was syndicated. It was like they were like Legends of Hercules and Xena. It was like one of those. Yep, that showed, yep, like, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. PIX or Channel 9 or whatever. I never really got into it. But uh, this movie itself just, I mean, it. I take it very personal. Like I said, <laughs> going online, I made the mistake of going to IMDb and immediately seeing the nasty negative reviews and being incensed. So Silver Cup Studios, the, the whole end sequence they have. I used to live in Queens and I took the train into Manhattan every day. And I would pass this on the 7 train. And see it every day. Silver Cup Studios, the big logo up on on the building, and I just they filmed part of that on 
on set. I mean, the whole fight sequence is is like a replication of the of the signage in the top, but they did film in on the building as well. Some of those scenes early again, just it's a very personal connection for me on a lot of this stuff. I enjoy it probably more so than most. Is people. that still there? The silver cup? Uh... I don't know. It's been a long time. It's in Queens. You will notice. That, so I mentioned before that there's a, there's a lot of continuity errors throughout this movie. Uh, maybe they just didn't have it in the budget to uh, to hire somebody. When you first see the, it says Silver Cup Studios, but then when Brenda's tied up at the top, it just says Silver Cup. There's no studio. <laughs> You know, even when they're fighting and they break through, you know, the, the, the water tower falls. There's a ton of water. They break through the skylight, fall to the ground, 25 feet below. No water falls behind them. Yeah. That, oh, this this is one cool thing which I wanted to bring up, which is there's a scene where Ramirez is teaching Connor about the quickening. And they're on the beach and there's a stag, a red stag. Yes. And and so he's like, you got, you know, feel it, feel it. And it's a really fun, a fun scene. Well, supposedly the stags uh, had all lost their horns during that time of filming. And so the animal handlers glued them back on. <laughs> they glued the horns back onto the animal. And all I can think of is, do you remember that scene in Scrooge where they're trying to do a live version of, of uh, A Christmas Carol and they can't get the antlers to stay onto the, the mouse? And he's like, why don't you staple them? <laughs> so you glued, you glued the horns onto the deer. I think that there'd probably be some animal right. Uh, activists uh, who'd be all over that. You're probably right. And there's probably some grandmother rights activists as well that are upset. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, about the screaming David. grandma. The yeah. Screaming well, grandma, we yeah. We haven't really talked about Kurgan, which Clancy Brown no. steals it. Just he tears, totally does. He totally tears does. Tears this movie up. Don't ever speak to me. Don't ever speak to me again. Do you understand? Good. He just, there's a scene in, in the uh, church and, you know, he's, ah, hello, ladies, you go to the nuns. I guess after filming, he actually went up and apologized to them because he didn't want them to be offended. <laughs> but in the moment, he was the character and he kind of just, yeah, it's. He is like a monster in this movie. It's Yeah, well, he is a monster. Yeah. So yeah. here's the thing, which is we see numerous times. One of my favorite flashbacks is when Connor, uh, what is it, like the 1780, 1784. Five, where he where he gets into the the rapier uh, sword fight with the guy because because he insulted his wife and he gets stabbed numerous times he falls down the guy thinks he's dead and he gets gets back up because you're immortal you heal and yet Kurgan still has a scar on his neck from Ramirez from <laughs> two hundred years ago how come that never healed I never thought of that until I'm watching it this time and he actually goes out of his way because they have a police sketch of him. So he puts uh, safety pins through it to make it look like he's a punk rock. He goes, I'm in disguise. And I'd also, I like to point out my own Kurgan uh, inconsistency here. When he's fighting Ramirez, they're in their epic battle uh, and they're going up the side of the inside of the castle. Yes. Every time Kurgan hits the castle. Oh yeah, it, goes, it like implodes. So it implodes. It right. doesn't explode. The rocks, fall in, the, the rocks fall inward, you know, whenever he yeah. strikes the wall. Well, if you want to watch something funny, and you probably can only catch us on the Blu-ray, you can actually see one of the stagehands at the very bottom during one of the lightning flashes behind the wall, like pushing the rocks. You, you catch <laughs> it for like a split second. So again, like I said, there's just, they try, they just plowed through this thing. They're probably like, ah, screw it. We'll fix it in post. You can see the wires holding them up at the end of the movie. Silly stuff like that. That just probably does take some people out of my wife knows that I, I've watched this movie ad nauseum. And again, she's really into like the Scottish culture. When he walks into the bar and he orders a, a Glen Fittich or a, a Glen Morale on the rocks, which is a single malt scotch. He asks for it on the rocks. No rightful Scotsman would ever ask for single malt scotch on the rocks. You drink it neat, which is just straight up and warm. You don't drink it with rocks. So that's one of those, like that took her out of it. She's like, that, that would never happen. Oh, so you believe the guy can live immortal, but you can't believe he would order scotch with rocks. <laughs> Like, that's where you draw the line. I, this, this movie just stands on its own for me. Now, as a newbie to this, I was admittedly a little confused by the quickening, the gathering, the prize, and where these guys came from. We must fight until only one remains. You are safe only on holy ground. None of us will violate that law. It's tradition. The initial origin of the immortals. I'm afraid to go further into this. Because it sounds like Highlander 2 attempts to explain this. But... Highlander 2 goes out of its way to explain this. And uh, yeah, oh yeah, you want to go down that road, they're aliens. 
which I don't like. I don't, I don't like, like that. Yes, I don't like that yeah. either. I don't um, even like the fact that you told me that, that, you know, yeah, and I didn't no. even see this movie. Yeah, no. Highlander 2 should just, they should take every copy like they did that little E.T. Uh, Atari game and just bury it in a <laughs> landfill somewhere. So the prize, so, so help me out here. The prize is pretty much ultimate knowledge of everything in the world. To But, but mortality as mortality. well. Mortality, that's it, right. Right. So what would what, Kurgan, why would Kurgan want that? Not only that, the, Ramirez said if, if Kurgan wins the prize, like it would just be horror. It would be terror. No, he would be human. You could kill him. Yeah. So, th- right. That one, that kind of falls apart, which is like, wait, wait. It's like, it's like salmon being drawn back to, you know, your spawning grounds, getting this urge to, to, to meet in a faraway land. And they've all, there's a handful of them left and they all meet. And it's Castigiri meets Castigir on the Sesame Street Bridge in <laughs> Central Park. I kept waiting for Big Bird to show up. Yeah, and really, because the, the question is posed earlier on between Ramirez and Connor, Connor McLeod. Connor, Connor McLeod. The, McLeod asks him, you know, would you cut off my head? if it came? And right. Ramirez never answers him. Right. So, you know, just kind of grins and, you know, and does a shoulder toss, you know, and, and that's, that's the end of that conversation. Right. So it kind of yeah. begs the question, if Kurgan wasn't around, would they kill each yeah, other? Yeah, you, you probably would think that. Yeah. I mean, could you coexist? I mean, do you need to kill each other? Can't you be like, all right, you take half the power, I take half the power. Yeah, you know, it's not bad being immortal. Let's just stick, right. let's yeah. stick Listen, this we out. Yeah, we've lasted this long, you know. I changed my name. He never once changed his hand, handwriting in all those years. And I also got, I got a, a bit of a uh, American Werewolf in London feel because Brenda, once again, here's a woman who doesn't know this guy. He's actually, he's actually a potential murderer, and yet she invites him to his house, and then they have sex. Maybe he's, so got, got, that a, he's, got, he's got that glow, right? You got, I guess it. <laughs> <laughs> he, you got to question these women of the 80s, or what's going on there? So, so uh, you know what? I, I really want to point this out as well. There was a scene that made me laugh out loud. It was during Kurgan and Connor's first New York battle, right? There's a, there's a New York NYPD helicopter that shows up. Oh, yes. That says, put down your weapons. And then they run right. away. Hey, where are you going? Right. Come back here. <laughs> <laughs> like they're shocked. <laughs> they can't you're, follow them. You're in a helicopter. You're in a helicopter. Yeah. Ah, let them go. Let them go. And then the scene I loved, you, you get a glimpse of a bagpiper in the, going back to the battle scene from, from Scotland. Yep. Um, everybody's fighting. There's carnage. There's death. There's beheadings, and there's a bagpiper just playing, like walking I think that through. That happens though. I think that you know you want a little theme music while you're yeah. uh, killing everyone. I would want to kill the bagpiper. I, I that would be very just like playing a video game. Like it's very tempting to get those bystanders. You know. <laughs> well, that's another continuity error, which I guess the bagpipe that they used doesn't doesn't really exist in that form for like another hundred years oh really compared okay. to yeah all those bagpiper fans must have just stood up in outrage <laughs> in the theaters I, I do have a couple bagpiping albums floating around here somewhere you know what i heard also you probably know this as well before they got queen involved marillion was marillion yes about to yes. do the soundtrack yeah and they turned it down they turned it down <laughs> and they turned it down because they were doing some kind of a tour it's now they're looking had, back and they're like, eh, yeah, it wasn't the smartest move. They were actually going to give the lead singer, um, Fish, I think his name is, uh, was. They were going to give him a role as well in the role. movie. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing, too. If you, if you read deep enough, like every actor known to man was supposedly set to play this character, Connor McLeod, at one point. Even Sting. Supposedly Sting was, was in the run. Imagine that. Wow. I, this it movie, would, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have been the same. It, no, it would definitely be. It needs Christopher Lambert. It needs him. Oh, yeah. No, he, and I like him a lot. I like him in this, in this, this character. You know, when he's underwater and he's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's one of my favorite parts of the movie. And when he comes out, he's freaking, he's shaking yeah. the fish. I love that when he's underwater. Uh, he's got some great lines, you know, again, going back to the, the scene where he's fighting with the rapier guy and the guy just can't, he can't kill him. And finally he says, I apologize for calling your wife a bloated warthog. And I bid you good day. And he just <laughs> walks away. It's classic. It is, like I said, one of my top five movies. And people, you included, I'm sure, will, will live and die by this movie. They love it. This is, this is yeah, a cult yeah. movie to the extreme. Yes. Well, as we were looking on IMDb, there's a lot of detractors. I would just like to say, boo to you. I don't know why I've never actually sat down and watched this. Like I'm as I was watching it, yeah. It's you know, it's been in existence. A buddy of mine actually is one of the many cult members of Highlander. He's loved it since the eighties and could never 
talk enough about it yet. Maybe it was because of that. It just like, I didn't want to hear it anymore. So I never watched it, but who knows? Yeah. I remember specifically going into, I think it was a record store in Manhattan and they had the big French poster, which is a different side. I I think it was huge. It was like, it was like a billboard size, uh, like a bus poster. I absolutely loved it. But again, I think it was like $40, $50, which back coming out of college, that was just too much for me to to spend on a movie poster. But I did find it online and it is going to be part of our artwork for the uh, Instagram page. Nice. Okay. So I just live vicariously through that. There's a nice plug for our Instagram. There you go. Always. There. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and if anybody hasn't noticed yet, Mike is no longer with us. Mike, uh, he, Mike dropped. I think Mike uh, experienced a quickening. He did. He did. Yeah. Maybe he had a quickening right to the bathroom. He <laughs> He's <Yeah>. not <laughs> so this means that um, we are going to push back our Night Stalker discussion yet again. Oh, man. So, Night but, Stalker's getting no love. Yeah, I know. We're going to have to get Mike's buckets for Highlander next week. But what would you give it? Oh, what I got it. Listen, gonna it? I, I'm going to give it a rare five. Five. This five. is the first. I gonna, it is. I, I didn't even give Raiders of the Lost Ark five. No, you did not. This I is the know. And I was thinking to myself, I said, but I have to do it. I, I just absolutely love this movie. I have watched it so many times and I just continue to watch it. So, wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You see, and I make uh, no apologies about it. I really don't. And none needed, none needed. You know, talk about estimations being down. Yours is going to be lower of me pretty soon. I would give Highlander three and a half. Three and a half. Listen, you half, know, yeah. your first viewing, again, yeah. you know, it's a product of its time. It's, I'm coming at it from a very personal point of view. It, it, it was a movie that affected me when I saw it for the first time. And it's just, like I said, it's not a great movie. But that's what this is all about. It's just, you know, how, how do these movies connect with you? You know? It's true, yes. Yes, that's part of the reason we do this podcast yeah. is to yeah. visit this stuff and to get these feelings out. I didn't cry. I didn't cry like I did in Queen, but they were happy tears too. I, I couldn't believe, because I've never, I like Queen and I love the music. There was moments where I was just so swept up in who and what this guy was. And, and yeah, that, that whole live aid, not to go back to that, but it really moved me. Yeah. I was like, this is, this is, of course, I also w- wept at Mary, uh, Mary Poppins Returns uh, trailer. <laughs> so. Yeah, that was a little emotional as well. I got that trailer too. So right? I can only hope, we were talking about this before, there was an Elton John movie coming out, uh, Rocket Man. Yeah, um, which I seems felt, a little yeah. more fantastical. It doesn't, because I think it's, they even taglined it like, like a, a, a rock fantasy. Or right, something. kind of in the vein of maybe Across the Universe, that Beatles movie yeah, that yeah. Saw not too long ago. Yeah. So if they could capture just an iota of what they did in Bohemian Rhapsody, I think that we're in for a treat with that Rocket Man, hopefully. And uh, Taron Taron Egerton, Egerton. Yeah. Egerton. Uh, so, and it looks like just from the trailer that he is doing his own singing, which I I, I applaud. I mean, I guess maybe again, I don't know. You know, like you bring up um, David Bowie. You know, if they did a biopic and whoever they had, would you prefer his lip syncing to the original songs or? I think I would. I think I would prefer that they were lip syncing. And I, right. I think I, it would take I you out. Imagine that, you know, as good as Rami is in this movie as Freddie, you can't sing like Freddie. There's oh, no, no one can. can. Nobody no one can. can. No one could or can. Yeah. Um, I do remember who was the kid from uh, American Idol that toured with Queen a while. Uh, I think his after. name is Lambert too, right? Uh, oh, Adam Lambert. Yeah. Yeah. It all, right. it all ties Lambert. in. There, there you go. In. Adam and, Lambert. And, and, and again, you, like you said, you can never replicate what Freddie Mercury did. But this kid toured with them and he brought his own level of energy to yeah. it. And I actually would have liked to have seen that. You remember the uh, Freddie Mercury uh, benefit concert at Wembley in 92? Yep. Yeah. Bowie was there and Elton John was there and a, a bunch lot of, of other British guys, yeah. bands. And I think Seal did Who Wants to Live Forever. And I, that version oh. has always stuck with me. That's a great version of that song. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, you should. Yeah, that is, that's another key scene in uh, Highlander that we didn't talk about. After Ramirez is killed by Kurgan. And then you cut back to, you know, the decimated castle and they're living in a hut and Connor comes over the hill and he's looking for Heather, Heather, Heather. And she comes up over the hill and she's just got this old lady makeup on. Yes. Yeah. You know? I, she didn't look old. She just looked no. like she rolled out of bed. Yeah, like, <laughs> like, like, like somebody just cake, you know, like, like two minutes to airtime. Yeah. Yep. Some crap on her face and sent her on her way. But yeah, that, that music, that song is playing over it. And it's just so like, 
you know, who wants to live forever. And it's like, oh, she's going to die, but he's going <laughs> to live. Oh. So there you go. So, yeah. And as we said, we'll have to get Mike's take next yeah. week did, on did, Highlander. Did you get the impression that he liked it? Oh, I did. I did. I think he did. You know, he's, I think he's very well acquainted with the film. He's seen it numerous times. We were talking earlier in the week that he could probably do this show talking about it without watching without it. Again. Watching it. So familiar yeah. with it. Cool. Five buckets. I, went five, five. Yeah. I know. I know that's at some point I got to write down everything that I did. Cause yeah, for me not to give Raiders a lost art five is, is uh, remiss on my part. But yeah, the, and the only so far, I think I've, we weren't even giving buckets yet, but I would give alien five buckets. But again, right. It's because of your personal yeah. attachment to it. So your connection of when you saw it, who you saw it with, and the age, I think, really has... Like, if I saw this as a kid, I'd probably be like, eh, it's cool, or whatever. First year in college, exposed to... I mean, if you were 85, 86, so I'm, I'm being exposed to WLIR and all this new wave stuff I never heard of in my life. You know, I never I never really had a, a movie-going experience outside of, make the drive-in. You know, we went to the drive-in as kids growing up and even in high school, but to sit in a theater. And again, like I said, I saw this back to back with legend and I have almost the same connection with that movie as I do with this one, which is, it is really tangerine dream soundtrack. Yeah. Like elevates that movie. And again, it's not a great movie. You know, I think Ridley Scott and Tom Cruise both said, listen, we'll we'll never make another movie like this. So, so Jeff, be honest. The best day of your life, the day you saw these two movies or the birth of your children. Oh, you can't. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh my son Highlander <laughs> uh, we'll let you know uh, I yeah. can imagine seeing these two movies back to back I'd be completely overwhelmed I'd be in a catatonic state yeah and it's not like you know and you just go home and process and like I said you know my sketchbook shows that that these movies just they left an impression on me you know I went home yeah. and those key scenes I just I just had to get them out of my head and it wasn't like we didn't have internet back then you didn't have no Highlander fan magazine I mean, they did come out with a Highlander comic years later. Legend was such a one-off, but boy, you talk about that Tim Curry, the design of that character, uh, Darkness, is just, it's, yeah. We'll, we'll oh, get yeah. into that, because that movie, we gotta, we gotta. Yeah, recommend. we will. Oh, oh, we will. Yeah. So, yeah, Mike's not gonna be here for my confessional question, because no. he will roll his eyes. He probably would have disconnected anyways. So, our confessional this week. Confessionals. Since we are in the Queen rock and roll Highlander mode, what is your favorite all-time movie soundtrack? So should, you want to go first? No, I want you to go first. All right, all right. I had to go through my collection just to give myself some ideas throughout the week. And it was a tough choice, but I would have to say, just thinking to the one that I've listened to the most and Mm -hmm. like back to over and over again, um, and kind of treat it as a separate entity from the movie. uh, How can you really separate? That's that's part of the like I can't I can't listen to these like you just told me you know Queen the 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 soundtrack exists as an album there is no way in the world that I could listen to these songs and not equate it back to the movie. Well, let me explain. Okay. Uh, let me let me name my my okay. soundtrack okay. choice right. is going to be Head by the Monkeys. The monkeys. I love the movie. You know, it, it is not just a ninety minute episode of the monkeys tv show it is a really out there psychedelic trip for lack of a better word are we talking we're talking probably mid late 60s 68 i believe this okay came out. i was so, all of one year yeah. old so it was after the show was done kaput and they put this movie out but by that time all the teeny boppers had moved on so the movie was not a big box office success they were hoping that the soundtrack would do well because the monkeys were still a viable recording entity right. but this soundtrack kind of put the nail in that coffin as well oh no the, the soundtrack is produced by jack nicholson really who was in the movie and he's part of the production team of the movie as well so what he did was he took the songs and he he framed them with dialogue which is kind of a normal way okay. to put a soundtrack together these days uh and it was in the back in the day too if you think about all those disney soundtracks that have the story and the dialogues right yep. through the album yeah 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 yep that's my robin hood but this he kind of is, is taking lines at random a line from this point in the movie is is in the soundtrack and then it's answered by another line from the movie that's you know a half an hour later so he's it's the it's a collage of what's what you see in the movie so it's not like replicating the viewing experience it's an experience all its own. And for that, and because the songs are just great, the Porpoise song, As We Go Along, Circle Sky, it's the last recorded output of the four original monkeys together. 
Um, oh wow! Okay. So yeah, so I I really like it, and I'm a okay. big Monkeys fan, and that's my number. Well, one. I will say I I am a big Monkeys fan. We were in a we were in a pub down the street last night, and there was a band, and they launched into uh, Daydream Believer, and they did a nice cover version of it. Really? Uh, I can honestly say I have never seen this movie. You've never seen it? I have wow! Never seen it. We're gonna have to do this one. I, I, I mean, yeah. listen, I yeah. am all game. Listen, let's do it. So my uh, my soundtrack, I will tell you, it was one of the very first cassettes I got from the Columbia Record Club. Okay. Um, circa nineteen seventy nine. This 79. I think movie actually earned. I don't uh, maybe nominee. I don't think that they actually won for oh, best song. Let, let me try to guess what this is. Did it come okay. out in seventy nine? The movie came out in seventy nine. And are there songs on the soundtrack or is it just orchestral? Oh, no, or? there's songs. Yeah, there's songs. songs. And the songs, uh, the, the main song, uh, I think actually is up for uh, best song in 19, the 1980s. Sung by Donna Summer? Not by Donna Summer. Oh, I was by, going, okay. You want to know who sings it? I'll, t- I'll tell you tell the me, artist. Yeah, tell me, tell me, tell me. <laughs> Kermit the Frog. Oh, you just gave it away. Okay, the Muppet movie. The Muppet movie. Moving right along. Moving right along. Rainbow Con- well, Rainbow Connection was the one that was uh, uh, up there. So even even last week when we were talking about American Werewolf in London and we brought in Frank Oz. Yeah. Frank Oz to me is always Fozzie the Bear. And I this is the movie that I I probably saw this movie for the first time on laser disc. <laughs> somebody somebody had a laser disc, which I still think may might be better than some of these four K <laughs> uh, TVs we have now, but. Rainbow Connection, moving right along. There's a duet between Kermit the Frog and Ralph the Dog uh, playing the piano, hope that something better comes along. Yes. Like, these songs yes. are just, to me, again, they're kiddie songs or whatever, but, you know, the Muppets, Jim Henson and, and his group took this silly stuff and they kind of elevated it to the next level. And that whole song with Dr. Teeth and his band. Dr. Okay. Teeth, yeah, can you picture that? So, and of course you got the Miss Piggy love song or whatever. <laughs> uh i know this i know this album inside now does Move it have, does it have dialogue does it have dialogue oh absolutely yep. yeah okay. especially especially when you get kermit and uh fozzy in in the studebaker it's a song but it's almost like a rap because they're talking at the same time and then they launch back into the song move right along chugga-dum, chugga-dum, but loose and fancy free getting there is half the fun come share it with me there you go these people right now are just turning off their radio they're like oh i'm <laughs> done with this show and mike will be like are you kidding me because he probably I don't, think, I don't think this is bad you know i don't think this is okay you know, mike I... on the other hand he probably chose quadrophenia or something <laughs> you're probably right he yeah. actually, he wanted to do quadrophenia for this show oh did he suggested highlander yeah because uh, at the musical you know uh, yeah, there you go so yeah, I'd be surprised. Oh, if I nailed that on the head, kudos for me. Muppet movie. Yeah, I've got a story about the Muppet movie. Okay, go ahead. Muppet movie was in the theater the same time that Alien was. Alien. And yeah. I saw the Muppet movie in a theater that was also showing Alien at the in the on the other screen. It was a two screen theater. It wasn't. It was before the days of the mall megaplexes, really. Right. So we watched. A buddy of mine watched Muppet movie. And I dared him, let's go sneak into Alien. So a- <laughs> after the movie, you know, we watched the, the entirety of the Muppet movie and the Alien was still, it was a matinee. And we were dropped off there by our, our moms and we were going to get picked up probably in like 20 minutes. So we wanted right. to sneak a peek at what was going on in Alien. So we like tiptoe across the, as if nobody yeah. could see us in the lobby, right? There you go. So we oh, you both got to sneak into theater story here. I had my hands on the door, right? And the yeah. door is opening and I'm getting nervous because, you know, I know Alien is a scary movie and this is taboo. This is an R-rated movie. And I can't believe I'm about to do this. Usher's hand on my shoulder. Oh. I get the door open an inch. He's like, where are you going, like, son? Yeah, exactly. It was something to that effect where like I was in trouble and it was uh, my mom's like, in there. Yeah. <laughs> now how old were you? Well, with the Muppet movie, I was probably eight years old. Wow. Summer of like... 79, yes, eight years old. That's a that's a long gone bygone time where your parents would just dump you off. Yeah, I know. I, right. know. I, I can't believe that they did now yeah. thinking about it now. I would never do that. I would No, never. right? Yeah. yeah. We live in a different world. Yeah. Sad. But yeah, that's funny. Yep. I don't remember ever jumping theaters again, but that was, you know, the, like I said, the, uh, the Highlander. Oh, so you didn't pay for Legend. You like snuck in. Oh, no, we snuck in. Yeah. Contra no, band. Yeah, it was, oh, I'll, okay. I'll tell you right now. It was, uh, I think it was a Sunrise Mall in Long Island. I don't remember. It might've been a Sunrise Theater. I don't remember now. But yeah, no, we, we and, they, and now they stagger them. Now you can't walk, you walk in and you miss 20 minutes. My friend, Mike DeHoe, 
who was in my class. He was one of the other artists. And he was like, we got to go. We got to go. And we just, we literally, I've never done anything like that in my life. And we just, we went from as soon as the movie ended and we jumped and we went to the other theater and we saw the legend. So you're the reason that the, it tanked at the box office then? Probably because I didn't pay for it. <laughs> you didn't pay yeah. for it. Yeah. No, I think it was Tom Cruise whining about it. So next week we are going to cover Rick's exit from The Walking Dead. Wait, Rick's leaving? Yeah, you didn't know that. Sorry, sorry. Spoiler oh, alert, spoiler alert. We've only been talking about it for eight months. So, yeah, we haven't talked about Walking Dead on this no. show for quite some time, but we figure now it's no better time than any because we may not watch it after Rick's That's gone. True. Knows, yeah. <laughs> this may be our swan song. <laughs> exactly. This is definitely... Uh... So we haven't really discussed a good matching feature with The Walking Dead. You know, Mike really needs to be part of that discussion, so we'll bring that to you as soon as we can. But, but yes, next week is going to be a Walking Dead episode, so maybe we can do a zombie flick. Who knows? We haven't done any of the Romero movies yet, so that this could be a good that chance. That is true. Whose choice yeah. is it? Do we even know whose choice? Is I it? think we've we've thrown out that out the window. I don't know. Yeah. We'll do, we'll discuss. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that so endeth our Bohemian Rhapsody Highlander discussion. Hope you enjoyed it. Yes, I did immensely. Thanks for everybody again for listening. All those that have stuck with us and our new listeners, welcome. And the Fiji Islands. Yeah, Fiji Islands and the Philippines and Jamaica. We're yeah, still maybe. trying to conquer America, and here we are. Yeah, overseas. I know, exactly. Yeah, all, and all you Queen fans, welcome. You know, stick around. There you go. Yep. Yeah. So there can be only one. All right. Ciao. A pleasure. Yep. Bye. Academy Award. Oh, for what? For best movie ever made. <laughs>